All right. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us. We wanted to welcome you to Three Kobolds Gaming, our first official venture through Paizo's Agents of Edgewatch Adventure Path. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining us on this adventure. We're going to take a quick moment to introduce ourselves. My name is Will Toll. I have been GMing and DMing and playing tabletop role-playing games for close to 10 years, and I will be GMing for this adventure. And I'm super, super excited to be sharing this new story with you. So, who would like to introduce themselves next? All right, I'm EG. What are we saying? I've been playing tabletop role playing games for about two years now, maybe two and a half. Very new to it, relatively speaking, at least in present company. Um, I did the official artwork for our characters, and that's about it. All right. Hi guys, my name is Daniel. I've been playing D&D and other tabletop games for around five years now. Excited to play this campaign, and uh, I'm really excited to play a witch, which... Uh, we'll get there, we'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. Didn't really have anything for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ben. Hello everyone, my name is Ben Johnson. I'm very excited to be playing Pathfinder 2nd Edition uh, here with, with my good buds. I've been playing... Tabletop role-playing games for about a decade or so. Um, this will be my second Pathfinder 2nd Edition campaign. Um, so I'm very excited to dig more into Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Hello, everyone. My name is Jack. Um, I have been doing nerdy stuff for my entire life, but only playing role-playing role tabletop <laughs> there you games. Go. Tabletop role-playing games. Games which you play on a table as a role for only about a year and a half. Um, so this is a really new hobby for me that I'm very excited to continue diving super deep into. Um, and yeah, Pathfinder 2nd Edition has been really fun, the very little of it we've played, and I'm super, super excited to be diving farther into it. And hello, my name is Gray. I've been playing role-playing games for probably uh, just as long as Ben, about a decade. Uh, I've done various campaigns over the years with everyone in this call and everyone in this game, but never all together. I'm thrilled. I'm also thrilled to be playing and not DMing. That is awesome. Uh, so <laughs> grateful, Will. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to get into it, man. Let's go. All right, awesome. Well, as you can see, we have a great cast here ready to tell some amazing stories. But before we jump in, I do have a few things that I wanted to mention. Firstly, the adventure we're playing was written by a variety of talented authors. Uh, but the first book that we're starting today was written by a man named James Sutter, a very talented guy. And the adventure as a whole was published by Eric Mona of Paizo Inc. The majority of the story and art that you will see here was produced by Paizo, the only specific exception being that all of our character art was done, as she said, in-house. Next, quick heads up with a content warning. Tabletop role-playing games explore a variety of themes, some of which can be sensitive. As such, we strive to do our best to be intentional about how we approach the themes that we do, especially the ones that might be a little bit more difficult for some. Some of the topics that might arise in this adventure include mention of serial killers, torture, non-consensual voyeurism, and violence against children. As a group, we've discussed these topics and we will do our best to be very careful with them. These topics will not be present in the vast majority of our episodes, but it's only fair for us to give a warning to our viewers that they could potentially come up in the future of our story. And finally, I think one of the most important announcements is that we want to address the fact that the adventure path we are playing was written with the intent that the players play the role of town guards. Eric Mona has released an official statement from Paizo regarding the Agents of Edgewatch adventure path on their official Paizo blog, which I highly recommend everyone checks out. But we at Three Kobolds Gaming believe unequivocally that Black Lives Matter, and as such, we have removed that framing of law enforcement from this adventure, and we'll be playing it from a different perspective. As such, if you're familiar with the adventure path and see that we aren't playing it exactly as written, just know that it's because we don't believe we should play a fantasy adventure about being law enforcement, and as such, we will be playing as a band of heroic adventurers fighting evil. And with all of that being said, let's begin. Welcome to Absalom, the city at the center of the world. Absalom is arguably the largest city in the entirety of the world of Galarian, thanks in large part to its location on the Isle of Kortos in the middle of the Inner Sea. This makes it a prime location as a conflux of trade and a strong strategic presence for any military campaigns in the region. 
Because of this, Absalom has been besieged by countless armies, tyrants, and generals, and has never once fallen. Furthermore, the city itself is the seat of ascension for no less than four gods and goddesses who have passed the trial of the Star Stone, the massive legendary stone that is housed at the center of Absalom, enshrined in the ancient Star Stone Cathedral. Due to its prestige, position, and influence, it stands to reason that Galarian's calendar is measured by Absalom's founding, and ensured by the fact that Absalom has remained defiantly independent since its inception. The year 4717 nearly brought down the great city of Absalom, though, as Tarbophon, the Whispering Tyrant, led his vast army of undead to siege the city. In the midst of the siege, the Primarch of Absalom, Lord Geyer, mysteriously disappeared, causing even more chaos and confusion. The High Council, during an emergency meeting, nominated the Captain of the First Guard, Winsel Starborn, to the position of Siege Master, where he valiantly led the defense of the city. As Tarbophon closed in on the Star Stone, eager to ascend from lichdom to godhood, a group of powerful adventurers managed to destroy his physical form, dispersing the army and breaking the siege a full two years after it had begun. Our story begins in the wake of the Whispering Tyrant's defeat. The year is 4720 AR, Absalom Reckoned, and this year marks a rather turbulent time for the city. The newly elected acting Primarch, Winsel Starborn, is eager to reclaim the lost sections of the city and rebuild following the siege. As such, he declares the return of the Radiant Festival, a massive celebration of the city whose traditions trace back nearly 3,000 years. The festival grounds is declared to be in the Precipice Quarter, one of the sections of Absalom, that was destroyed during the siege and newly rebuilt, and it is said to be the stage of Absalom's continued defiance towards all aggressors. The festival grounds house many exhibits from all across Galarian, and exhibitors and fairgoers have been flooding into the city for months. We find ourselves in the newly built Tipsy Tengu, on the outskirts of the Precipice Quarter, near to the fairgrounds. A fairly new bar, only but two months old, though already filled to the brim with tourists and townies alike. The owner and innkeep, Belberry, a halfling woman with a warm smile and a wit twice as quick as her service, takes a small pause to address two goblins who've just strolled up to the bar. She directs them down a hallway next to the bar towards a door with a reserved sign hung out on its front. The goblins approach the door, each glancing at each other in turn before opening it and stepping through to a small private room. Seated on the benches beside a long oak table are three figures. A sheepish gnome whose brown curls seem to offer little cover to the nervous-looking man. A middle-aged human woman with piercing eyes filled with curiosity as they take in the newcomers. And a human man now standing at the head of the table with a salt and pepper mane that tumbles to his shoulders. He spreads his arm in welcome, saying, The Shark Thorn Grabber? As soon as I heard about you, I knew I had to get you on our team. Greg, please take a moment to describe Shark for us. So Shark is uh, of average goblin height, less than three feet tall. His skin is a lighter tinge of, uh, of green, almost a teal, only slightly darker than the other goblin. Um, but you do notice uh, when his face kind of turns around, and I always envision it in the camera, um, that his face has these deep lines, these deep stress lines. His ear has a chunk out of it. But his face is very, very, very similar to the face of the goblin directly next to him. In fact, you might say that the two faces are identical when you see them both right next to each other. I'm so glad you could make it. And who is this with you? And before either of you respond, Jack, could you please describe the person who entered with Shark? The second very similar looking goblin, he's more of like a medium seafoam green. Um, and he has a very blank and stoic countenance about his face. It's very similar to Shark's, but he's got this more like aloof look to him. Much more clean, no scars, no real markings. He's wearing this like vest trench coat that looks like to be made of bear skin with no shirt underneath and these like long purple pants and no shoes. So he's walking around kind of barefoot, kind of open chested around this bar. And he is covered in tattoos. And do either of you respond to the man's question? Yeah, Shark says, uh, Oh, yes, well, I have brought my business associate here. He also happens to be my brother. But Bear, please introduce yourself to the group. Dr. Forsyth, it's very yeah, nice to hello. see you. Yes, uh, it's, it's a pleasure. Ah, there is a man standing in the corner of the room, having already taken a seat and, and rising upon the goblin's entrance. Ben, could you go ahead and 
and describe this character for us. Yes, so Dr. Xavier Forsyth is a rather distinguished looking middle-aged man. He is about six feet tall, a uh, human, except his skin is this pale blue-gray color, which is a little off-putting at first and unusual, but he's, he's solidly, uh, he looks like a human. He has this white overcoat that has years of worn showing on it um from it uh when he stands up he he holds his his cane sort of aloft um to to shark as he as he says yes shark i i, I trust you are you are well uh, quite well yes this is my brother whom i was telling you about uh this is bear dr forsyth dr forsyth bear hello hello bear it's a it's a pleasure to meet you and i i i, I hope that you are able to assist me in wrangling your brother when time calls for he is a. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, a wily fella. Ah, yes. Wily fella is perhaps the best way to describe him. Please, Dr. Forsyth, it is uh, preferred for you to call me Penumbra. Penumbra? Yes, well, excuse Penumbra. me. Shark is, like, shaking his head adamantly at you while he's talking. <laughs> <laughs> my brother uses my former name, but I have gained another. Please, if you would. Yes, well, the man ushers you both in to the table as you all are talking and closes the door behind. I'll save the rest of the introductions for when everyone is here, but I'm I'm so glad you'll both be signing on. And as he's saying this, another quick knock at the door. The gnomish figure pops up to grab it, opens it up, and Emily Grace, could you please describe the figure standing in the doorway? All right, so you see a little two foot nine halfling woman with her hair sort of half up and half down. It's it's black and then fades to this light purple ombre. She's got this sort of like piratey look to her. She looks really, really, really happy as she's coming in. The the man at the head of the table beams and smiles, saying. Twinkle Toes! And here I thought you'd be too busy staging your own performances. I assumed you wouldn't take my offer very seriously, but here you are. Wonderful. Have a seat. Well, honestly, I'm so excited to be here. I'm so surprised that people still remember me. Oh, uh, with your reputation, I'm sure it'd be hard to shake it once somebody's seen your performance. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. I'm excited. And, ah, yes, our last new member. And standing in the door is yet another figure which I'd like Daniel to describe. All right, you guys see this six foot tall half elf. He has a, he has dark skin tone. He has really bright red hair that he styles in a mohawk. So to get it out of his eyes, I guess. And uh, he's wearing a blue padded armor tunic that's like sleeveless. And he has these leather cuffs that he wears. And on the padded armor, you, have, you see a, ban a bandolier, I believe it's pronounced, of healer's tools. And uh, he also, on his right shoulder, it's just a small white dove, just perched naturally. It doesn't seem, the guy doesn't seem phased at all. Like, it seems totally normal for that bird to be there. And, uh, and yeah, he just walks in, uh, smiling at everyone, and uh, yeah, he just takes a seat wherever, the, wherever there's one to be had. He says, fantastic! I believe that is everyone. Close the door and grab a seat, and we have much to discuss. The gnome seated on his right stands up once again, closing the door, but not before the sounds of drunken crying begin to emanate from the adjacent room. Though as the door closes, the sound is muffled for the most part. This place has been getting more and more rowdy each night. So glad I was able to book the private room for this most special occasion. Welcome. Welcome to the newest members of Knight's Menagerie. Most of you know me, but for those who don't, my name is Archibald Knight owner and proprietor of the menagerie. To my left is the wonderful Manera Frum, our head veterinarian. And to my right is my second in command, Mr. Remy, my lead zookeeper. Now, I've offered each of you a position with us since we seem to have lost a few crewmates. I've always hired decent people, but it's not uncommon for crew members to leave us when we reach new cities. But I didn't, I didn't expect the people to disperse until after the festival. There's so much coin to be had. Anyway, Bastro and Knight trails off as a series of loud banging and thumps and gasps can be heard coming from the other room. Moments later, the door opens and you can see that the main hall of the Tipsy Tengu is a raucous mess of tipped over chairs and spilled drinks. A motley group of drunken adventurers is the clear cause of the chaos. 
including a dwarven bruiser waving around an axe, a sloppy elf in robes, an armored human worshipper of Caden Kalian, and a leather leather clad halfling. Oh, excuse me. I thought this was a washroom. A well dressed man with an ornate cane, bold blue eyes, comes further into the room, pulling a kerchief from his coat to cover his bloody nose. You look like a fine lot. I'd be dreadfully thankful if you were to deliver us from the churls and belligerents. He lowers his voice conspiratorially and adds, Honestly, I'd never allow their sort into my hotel, but poor Belberry thought they'd add flavor. And they certainly have. He sticks out his hand to shake. Hendred Pratchett, proprietor of the Dreaming Palace, and this is my associate Rosso. He sticks his hand out to shake, and then nods hard, looking towards the half orc woman beside him. We thought we'd come down and enjoy a quiet night of dinner and drinks before the opening of day festivities tomorrow. So much for rest and relaxation, though, eh? He clutches his bloodied and bleeding nose and takes a seat. Right now, would you mind getting them out? As he looks to the group that is assembled. Oh, we've only just met one another, and we already have a rivaling group of adventurers. There can be only one. Come back! Let us... Yes. And the goblin shark jumps up out of his chair and just, like, marches out of the room. All right, well, I suppose we're taking care of this now instead of what we came here for, but I suppose that's okay. He gets up as well and follows his brother. DM, can I do a perception check to to see if this guy's telling us the truth? about this circumstance. Sure. So, are you trying to sense his motive, or are you just looking him over? Or looking into the room I would like beyond? to sense his motive. I would like to sense motive. Okay. So, for people who are not acclimated to tabletop role-playing games, welcome to our first actual mechanical thing that we're doing. So everything we've done up to now is a lot of storytelling and hanging out and playing pretend, but now we're going to actually roll some dice, crunch some numbers, and get some results from it. This is where the meat of the game comes from. Everybody has a character sheet that we're utilizing, which has all of our numbers and our bonuses and our skills and our abilities and what our characters can do. Um, There's a lot of stuff on here, which we will cover in time as things come up, but one of the biggest things to remember is perception. That is the most utilized skill in any role-playing game that has it. By far. (laughs) What's happening right now is that Twinkle Toes is trying to perceive her interpretation of this guy's truthfulness. The way it's going to work, I believe we're going to do a secret check for this, right? No, we're going to roll this one out open. I'll let you know when it's a secret check. So Emily Grace is going to roll a a, a die, which is usually the D20, the 20-sided die, with an at her perception modifier. She's trying to beat a certain score that is set by the game master or by the adventure in order to gain information or in order to accomplish her goal. So she's going to roll against what's called the DC or difficulty class. Um, and if she were to succeed, she'll get some useful information. Yeah, so go ahead and roll that perception to sense motive. First official roll, right, don't blow gonna it. Be, that's going to be a 23. 23. Nice. Yo, that's a good Big. start All right, for us. That is, Natural 18 for our first All right, so let's That's go, pretty let's good. Go. Yeah, that, Only downhill from there. That is a success. <laughs> um, so there's a couple things, right? So you're... Uh, you're trying to glean just like how, how honest, I guess, this man is being? Is that what you're going after? I'm, yeah, basically trying to figure out if like maybe he is trying to, like, if he did something to cause this ruckus and is trying to like just skirt off his issues on mm-hmm. to us to handle, like if he's being forthright with what's sure. going on. So one of the biggest things you notice is that the door to the room is, is now open. You see what was once a, you know, nice, if busy tavern hall is now essentially empty except for these four figures which seem to be one sobbing uncontrollably into a mug another who is the dwarf i mentioned who is just waving around an axe and yelling at people you also see the caden kalianite who is sitting in currently in front of four mugs two of which he's you know double fisting one of which is in his face currently uh and you see him just like pouring beer all over the place knocking over mugs or plates and things there's obviously like these this group is obviously causing some kind of issue Hendred himself is flustered, but he's trying to maintain this, like, you can tell that he is, like, trying very hard to maintain this professional, like, businessman composure, despite having just been knocked in the face and with a bloodied, if not broken, nose. As far as what caused it, he seems to genuinely want you guys to, to kick them out. You're, you're not quite able to discern 
not having seen anything, what specifically caused this. Sweet. Does okay. the tipsy Tengu connect? He said the Dreaming Palace is his hotel, right? Uh, he mentioned that he owns a hotel known as the Dreaming Palace. The tipsy Tengu is not associated. Different. Yeah. Okay. Um, Shark is already out of the room. and As is Penumbra. Yeah, yeah. And whoever is closest is the one that he approaches, which I think is the one sobbing into the mug, correct? So I'm actually going to drop you guys over to the map. Oh, oh the map. Look at All this. Right. Drop everyone here. So as you look out into the tavern, there's a couple of things that you see. One, you see here, there is an elven woman who's currently sobbing into some drinks. There is a human man, Caden Kaylee Knight, there. You also see a passed out patron here with a little halfling sloppily trying to reach into him his pocket and every time he like snores or rolls over she like gingerly pulls her hand away and then like slowly starts making her way trying to get back into the pocket and up here is the dwarf who seems to be currently looking at the new entrance to the room and saying i'll prove it to you all you'll know my name i am balor of stonemore and i'll fight any of you here as you enter Room. What would you all like to do? Shark beelines for the dwarf with the big axe, like not even hesitating. Doctor Forsyth kind of follows halfway and says, "Shark, please, we've talked about this." Oh no, it uh, it's fine. I, I I will I will keep my temper and my head and my wits about me. You want some action, Goblin? I'll give you a good fight. <laughs> As he's like swaying side to side, holding his axe now in front of him. No, that, that wouldn't be quite fair. I, I, I would like if we were to engage in a physical altercation that it would be a fair physical altercation, but rather I've been hired to remove you from the premises, so I'm wondering what are the steps I need to take in order to get you to leave? Uh, go ahead and roll me a diplomacy. Well, while he's doing this, um, you, you mentioned Caden Kalian. Yes. Uh, would everybody know who that is? Um, you said that he's a worshiper of Caden Kalian. Yeah, that's a pretty common household name. Caden Kalian, mm-hmm. for our viewing audience, is the god of drunken heroes, basically. Likes a good time and likes making life better. Think of, of a heroic Dionysus, almost. Caden Kalian is, like, regarded as one of the coolest gods in the Pathfinder universe because that Starstone that we mentioned before, the whole idea of the Starstone is the Starstone test, where if you touch it, you ascend to godhood, but everyone dies trying to do it. And Caden and Kalian did it on a drunken dare one time and ascended on accident. And so now drunks around the world worship him as like the drunken hero. It is like the coolest story. Yeah, um, he's I entitled a- the accidental god. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I rolled an 11. An 11. Okay. Yeah. Yo. <laughs> uh, he kind of looks down at you. I'm not leaving. Only way you get me out of here is dragging me out. Well, the, the only way. Oh. I keep losing the accent. First episode. The only way. Well, I, I do suppose that uh, there is other ways that we could reach a result here. Is that money, booze, something something else that you would like? I can uh, hook you up with something harder if you prefer that. But kind of says he looks, that under his breath. He, he looks, well, I guess it wouldn't be that far down at you. But he does look slightly down at you. Once again, hefting his axe, he says, No! <laughs> Only thing I want is a good fight. And he, like, shoves you across the chest with the handle of the axe. And we're going to go ahead and roll initiative. Oh, we're oh right. shoot. Oh. Yo. All right. I did oh, not see Lord. that. Coming. Okay. okay. Let's go. All right. So what's happening right now is that we are engaging in combat. Previously, we were just kind of in what's called exploration mode. Uh, This is what's called encounter mode, where we are engaging in an encounter that will be turn-based. Right now, rolling initiative determines where we will be placed in the turn order in order to enact all of our things. It's going to be a lot to throw at you all at once, but basically every character is going to have three actions with which they can use stuff on their turn. Different things your character can do will have different numbers of actions. So everybody will try their best to describe in full detail what's going on, and we will walk you guys through our first combat yeah right into it okay so i'd like everybody to go ahead and give me their initiative scores starting with shark five nice five. <laughs> well good start. Done. good start that's a really high number for everyone who's watching really good 
penumbra what you got for me? I have a 17 for you, sir. <laughs> oh, Sarah's gonna save me. Dr. Foresight. That's a 21. Whoa! Hey, hey, hey. The doctor is in. <laughs> uh, Bastro. I got a five as well. Which of you two would like to go first? Gray can go first. I, I don't Excuse know how much it'll matter, but yeah, Shark. I can go. <laughs> Shark will go first. Uh, and Twinkle Toes. I have a 15. 15. All right, so as I mentioned, he like shoves you across the chest with the handle of his axe. Uh, so he's going to make a an attack roll against you. He is going to get a 14. Is that going to beat your armor class? That is oh, against oh, Shark, excuse me. Oh, against me, sorry. Uh, no, that misses. That misses my armor class. That misses. Okay, so that first attempt, he like, he's still... All of these guys are just kind of sloppy. Uh, but the first strike goes out, uh, and you manage to like sidestep it. As that happens, you notice all three of the other ones, their heads like perk up. And the the Kalianite just kind of like slams a, a mug on the on the table, and he says, "Oh, we're doing this, all right!" And like stands up. Um, Yo, these people just want to throw it down. What the heck? The scrap. The uh, pickpocket woman pulls pulls her hand out of the pocket of the the uh, passed out man, and just appearing in it appears to be a knife. And then the, the elven woman stands up, just tears still streaming down her face. Uh, you hear her muttering under her breath, but you're not quite close enough to, to hear what she's saying as she stands up. She doesn't draw her own knife, she draws someone else's <laughs> knife. <laughs> that's, that's a, pretty, that's that's a pretty pickpocket good. right there. That's good. <laughs> and she's that good. Bastro she's is that going good. to uh, let out a roar. And you watch the what was what? a drunken haze over his face turn into sharp eyes of clear rage as he enacts Whoa. a rage. Uh-oh. And Uh-oh. <laughs> with his third action, he's going to try to hit you with the axe, swinging it like a baseball club. What you got? <laughs> They're drunk, and an eight is not going to hit you. No way. All right. Shark is nimble. So he strikes, he enters a rage, and then he strikes again, nothing hitting. Uh, next up is going to be the holy man of Caden Kalian, who sweeps his hand wow. across the table, jumps over it. Uh, this will be difficult terrain, so he's going to go 10, 15, 20. Second action, he's going to move up on top of the table there and plop down next to Shark. And he will draw his rapier and is now standing there next to Shark, menacingly, we'll say. After Antoro will be... Dr. Forsyth. So Dr. Forsyth, he knows Shark. He's a patient of Dr. Forsyth's. So seeing Shark already get threatened by these two drunken fools, he feels very protective over Shark. Feels the need to care for Shark. So he's gonna first action enact an investigator ability called devise a stratagem. So what I do is I'm going to roll a d20 and assess the weakness of this dwarf. And I'm going to try to see the best place to, to, to maybe inhibit him from, from hurting uh, my patient shark. So I roll, and if I choose to attack the dwarf this round, I have to use that roll, but I can add a different modifier to it instead of the typical one. What'd you get there? So I rolled, it's a natural eight, so that would be a 15 total. And he is going to then, for his second action, he is going to walk over, he's gonna go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. And he is going to, he walks over with his cane and while he does, he draws his his sword cane out and will like put it in between Shark and the, the drunken dwarf and just say, friend, you do not want to do that. And that's going to be, unfortunately, his three actions. All right. So you give the dwarf a good up and down, trying to suss out any weak points. You notice that despite the rage, he's kind of still wobbling. You bet his, his balance probably isn't quite there. Maybe there's something you can do with that. Is that the end of your turn, Dr. Forsyth? Yes, that was three actions. Okay. Next up is going to be the halfling woman with a dagger out. It's going to go around 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 35... So that's two move actions to get there. Already has the dagger out. 
and will attempt to oh joy. stab Dr. Forsyth in the back. Oh. Let's see here. What's the under over on Ben dying first combat? <laughs> I'm heavily in favor. I believe it's going to happen 100%. Nah. Oh, the man. good doctor's going to live Yeah, she rolled a 26. Whoa. Oh. 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 Really high roll, really high are, roll there. Oh w- Will, are we yeah. playing that uh, flanking is minus to my AC, or did you add flanking to your uh, roll? So you are flat-footed, which would yeah, give you so minus two to your AC. Yes. That's, uh, that's a crit. <laughs> that's a crit? Oh, no. no. Yeah, since I'm flat-footed, that's a crit. Do you want to explain how that works, since you're the one who's suffering? Yeah, so when you get crit in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, it's a little different than D&D 5th Edition or Pathfinder 1st Edition. Instead of it just being a natural 20 or within a crit threshold, in combat, if you get hit by more than 10 of your AC, it's considered a crit. So my AC, when I'm flat-footed, is 15 and will roll to 26. So that's a critical threat, and I'm very scared right now. <laughs> yeah, so 10 over the armor class will be a critical hit, meaning that the damage is double. So, it's just a dagger. You're fine. I'm sure nothing could go uh-huh. wrong here. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, because I totally focus on constitution playing this character. <laughs> uh, so you take three points of piercing damage uh, as the dagger kind of like pokes you in the side, like right above your hip. But she hits like a nerve or something, and you also take oh, no. five points of precision damage from the sneak attack as she was able Whoa. to get around on your Whoa. bad side and nail that dagger right into a weak point. That's a real doozy. All right, that is the end of her turn, though. Let's see if you guys can turn it around. Now that I'm sorry, Twinkle Toes, I didn't actually write down your initiative. Would you go ahead and tell me that again for you? Fifteen. Fifteen. Mm-hmm. Up next is Penumbra. Penumbra. He sees that his brother is in some serious danger up there to to his northwest. So he's going to... He'll move a little bit. He'll go 5, 10, second diagonal for 20. Actually, he'll step right here instead. He'll just take a 5-foot step to the stride to this way. He will throw a Divine Lance, which is one of my spells that I can use. This, like, arc of white lightning just, like, appears in my hand, and he throws it at the Caden Kaylee and I will attempt to it very least. All right, go ahead and roll to hit. All right. Okay. A 17. Seven. Against oh, come on. That's got to hit. Against that armor class. Definitely hits. Nice. And it deals six points of six lawful points of damage. damage. All right, I'm gonna need you to calm down Six there, Zeus. Uh, <laughs> what else is that? Is that your turn? That is my whole turn. Okay. After Penumbra is the Elven woman down here. This Elven woman. That's a lot of fun. She will cast Grease. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. She will cast what? Oh, no. She will cast the spell called Grease. I'm bringing it up here so I can actually... Why do these people want to fight? They just want to scrap. (laughs) Yeah, sir. I got shanked in the back. By a stranger's knife. By not even her knife. So, four contiguous five-foot squares. Okay. She can't reach more than two people. So she is going to cast Grease on these four squares. Oh, that's just mean. And I would like Bastro and Twinkletoes to go ahead and roll me a reflex save. Okay. Or an acrobatics check, whichever you. I'm want pretty to sure Dan's computer already rolled enough reflex saves for him <laughs> with trying to come back. <laughs> a reflex save. A reflex save, or an acrobatics check. Um. Okay, I got a 24. I got okay. a 22. 22. You both succeed. Uh, so you're both still standing. However, when you try to move across any squares that are covered by the grease, uh, you will have to roll that again. Uh, so it includes moving out, for instance, if Twinkle Toes goes straight north. Cool. So, you watch her unfurl uh, this leather-clad book in her hand, um, some of the tears in her face dripping down to the pages. She waves her hand, mutters some arcane words, and this splat of, of sticky, slimy grease uh, almost like like uh, like bacon grease just 
hits the ground at the center of this location and spreads out across the floor. You're both able to maintain your composure, stay up in your feet, but it's become significantly more difficult. Uh, that is her turn. Speaking of Twinkle Toes, what would you like to do? All right, Twinkle Toes is going to be like, ah, oh, excuse me, don't get that on my outfit, and hops up onto the bar right here. So I'm assuming uh, I'll go have ahead to roll, roll another, another one. Save, yep. But, right? Right? Is that what I have to do? Yes. And I'm sure you'll be fine. There's nothing that could go wrong with this. 18. <laughs> 18, you're good. Okay. Um, will that be one entire move action getting up onto the bar, or can I? No, you still have your normal movement. Corner? Yeah, you still have your normal movement. Cool. Uh, the I'm bar, gonna, the bar isn't high there. enough to really actually impede your progress. It's meant for a, a halfling woman to bartend. Okay. So, so um, Will, fabulous. all she had to do was to roll another check to make sure she didn't fall leaving the square. Correct. Okay. So when the spell is cast, there's basic reflex save to make sure you don't fall down. And then each time you try to move in a square after that, you also have to roll to not try to fall down. Okay. Well, now that I am on top of the bar, I'm going to I'm going to try to get these attackers attention. Let's see. Who can I see? See all. Okay, so I can only see like half of the screen right now. Where is the elven woman that attacked us? She over? is The elven woman is to the bottom left of the bar. Here? This is Oh, yeah. over there. She is like due left from okay. Penumbra. Yeah. Fabulous. I'm going to I'm going to try to get her attention. I'm going to put on a little performance and try to gain Woo! some panache as a swashbuckler. And what action are you using to do this? I am using the performance action to do this. What so, does your performance look like? Yeah. So, um, Twinkle Toes is going to um, put on a little dance. She's um, She calls out to the woman and says, did that grease come out of your hair? As she um, does a little pirouette across the bar. Oh. <laughs> What's up? What's up? What's up? Hey, uh, uh, <laughs> what is up? <laughs> that's her little performance. Uh, that's it. Oh. So go ahead and roll your performance check. Cool. Oh my God. That's going to be an 18. 18. So you do succeed. And Fabulous. the woman who was, by the way, already crying. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> just kind of drops the book, <laughs> sobbing, takes a seat. And is just lying down on the table now. Oh, now I look like a bully. Okay. Twinkle Toes just bullying a strange oh, woman in the bar. Oh, sorry, Mike. Twinkle Toes is really mean. So sorry about that. Anyway, I'm so sorry. Um, you don't have to tell me. Tell her. I, Emily Grace, am so sorry. Twinkle Toes is not. Fair. Anyway, now that she has successfully performed and gotten this woman's attention, she now has what is called panache and as a swashbuckler what that means is that she can make an attack when she has panache and it has a special effect that attack so once that comes up we'll explain that a little bit more so with my cool. third action i am going to do i have any enemies around me i can't even see is this guy not bad? you do not, not. the closest that. enemy to you is like 25 30 feet away Okay, so for the rest of my turn, I'm going to move 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and get up in this guy's face. That's true. <laughs> and your, so your third action was to move over there. What else can... Is that it? Um, yes, that's the end of my... That is my End of Twinkle Toes' action. turn. Okay... Went, you went, she went, she went. Uh, next up is Bastro. All right, Bastro is gonna get closer to this mob over here. I guess I have to make a reflex save again, just to step into that square. Correct, correct. Uh, 20, uh, math is hard, 24. 24? Yeah. Oh yeah, you're good, you're fine. We're so dexterous. <laughs> All right, five, 10, 15. Yeah, I didn't realize I cast it on the two most capable people to get away <laughs> from <thought>. it. <laughs> and uh, seeing Dr. Forsyth get hurt, Dr. Forsyth and Bastor actually know each other. They've worked together before. And Bastor kind of sees him as like a, a mentor. So he's going he's gonna to call out to him, Sir, I hope you're not hurt. I'll, I'll help you out as best as I can. And he's going to cast Guidance on... Uh, before you... Okay, never mind. It's casting Guidance. <laughs> 
Yeah, so I'm gonna cast Four Guidance one, then. on it's not your turn. I'm gonna cast Witch Hex, which is called Stoke the Heart. Oh. And what Stoke the Heart does, it gives you a plus two to bonus on damage rolls. And it's, wow. I can sustain it for wow. a minute. And you're also casting that on Forsyth? Correct. Both okay. Guidance and Stoke the Heart. Ooh. All right. And is that all three actions? Yes, that's it. Wow. All right. Wow. What a what a turn. Let's hope uh, Forsyth can turn that into some good action. <laughs> um, where are we at now? Oh, that would be Shark's turn. Finally, after getting nearly hit <laughs> twice and watching all of this erupt around you, you finally come to your senses. Uh, surrounded by three of these people, uh, what are you going to do? So Shark looks around and he's taking in like the mayhem kind of in slow motion. And he kind of sighs and he's like, oh, well, this got out of hand quickly. Desmond, would you mind? And then quite literally like a miniature flubber comes out of his coat holding an elixir and just throws it back into Shark's mouth. He just like this little gooey green monster just kind of a, comes out of his, uh, sits on his shoulder and he's like holding a bottle the size of him and just tips oh it down God. Shark's throat. And Shark instantly, like, Shark kind of like rolls his shoulders back and opens his eyes and they're like bright red, like redder than they usually are. And he's got like bigger, sharper teeth than he normally did. Um, so a lot happened there. Uh, basically, <laughs> I have an alchemical familiar who is a little helper that I created with a combination of magicalness and some reagents and, my and alchemy. alchemy and alchemy in my <laughs> in my uh, tamperings. And what I did is I used one action to grant him two actions. And then he was able to pull one of the elixirs I had already made out of my bandolier and and then administer it to me. So um, and that posed that elixir was a bestial mutagen, which gives, oh. uh, which gives me a couple of of perks and uh shark shark kind of takes in he looks at the guy on his left he looks at the guy kind of ahead of him and then he <laughs> looks at this 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 is a halfling that stabbed uh Dr. correct Forsyth, right? and he looks yes. at this halfling wielding a bloody knife and he just, he just not her just, knife by the way <laughs> not, her, not knife. her knife and he reaches out and just goes to take a huge bite out of her just like <laughs> <laughs> uh, roll to hit. Uh, Shark is very anti-theft. That is going to be a 26. To Yo! Uh, Whoa! That nice. is a critical yeah. hit. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, Shark is going to uh, deal quite a bit of damage here. I um, can only imagine. For so those that's confused going as to why to he's be... named... 14 points of damage with two persistent bleed every turn. Wait, how much damage? 14 points of damage and then two persistent bleed damage every turn. So you take this mutagen and it like just shoots through you like a rush of adrenaline. You feel the fangs kind of in, like grow in your mouth. Uh, almost poking yourself with them as they they inch out of your your jaw you see you see and you smell the blood in the water you lunge out ripping a chunk out of her shoulder you just kind of spit it to the side and you watch as she just crumples straight to the ground <laughs> Baylor, the the dwarf just looks at you like eyes open wide takes a step back drops the axe oh oh what i I just, I just thought we were brawling. I didn't think you were gonna try to kill her. I, and the, we are out of initiative unless somebody is, wants to do something else. The Kaylee and I. Shark with his. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I was gonna say shark with his mouth dripping blood, turns to Doctor Forsyth and says, uh, "Doctor Forsyth, it appears this woman needs some medical attention." <laughs> and he kind of like. Wipes the, the blood and the, uh, <laughs> the doctor just like holding his back still is gonna he's just gonna like give shark this like terrifying look like or terrified look like what 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 bastards are gonna run uh, over to the woman and administer first the aid. kaylee knight steps in between uh the three of you kind of grabbing her you watch as he puts a, a glowing palm on her shoulder and the bleeding stops and he says, I think you've done enough here as he like 
pulls her body away. He, he looks over and says, Mariel, get your book! We're, we're leaving. Uh, Baylor like, grabs the axe by the handle and just kind of backs up slowly, dragging the blade behind him as he moves back. Like, just eyes locked on Shark. Uh, and eventually they all exit one by one. Did they steal anything? Do I... Do I, can I see if they stole anything else? Um, I mean, you could check that guy's pockets, but you're probably not sure what he had to begin with. Um, okay, but did it look like they were sneaking off with things that they'd stolen? Well, the only one who was actively stealing anything was very much unconscious. The other ones just got up straight and left. So it didn't look like they had an opportunity to, like, filch anything on the way out. Bastard's gonna check up on this guy who's just on the floor right now. Is he, like, dead, or is he unconscious? This guy here? Yeah. He's snoring loudly face down on the table. Okay. Uh, just a guy who had a, just had a little bit too much. I'm gonna try to shake him awake. Um, does he move at all? Is he awakened? He, like, grumbles. What you want? Just making sure you're okay, sir. And then I'm, after the I'm fine. And just, like, slams his face first <laughs> back into the table. Goes back to snoring. That's just gonna give him, like, a, a worried look and just walk away. <laughs> Um, so what are these two people doing here? The woman behind the bar and the woman kind of at the bar opening? Yes. Belbury, the woman behind the bar, looks up at all of you. Ah, well, I'm so glad you took care of those. They're getting a bit rowdy. I, I'd appreciate everything you've done. I was, wasn't quite sure what I could do. You look down at this, like, halfling woman, like, three and a half feet tall, especially next to, like, the dwarf and the human and the elf. She just appeared to be a little frightened. The woman beside the bar, obviously kind of a, a mater d' type deal. She has like a tray and a towel and some flagons of ale on the top. She's already setting out for you. I figured I'd go ahead and give you all a free round. And well, I offered for them to, to come in here and liven the place up with their stories. But well, you saw what happened. I gave them free drinks and they abused it. Regardless. I think you all have earned the gold I would have given them. And she, like, pulls out from under the bar 25 gold pieces, which she sets out. Uh, and on top of that, I'd be delighted if you all to stay and share a drink with me. That's uh, 25 gold each, right, Will? <laughs> Incorrect. She lays out a single amount of coins in the denomination of 25 gold. Penumbra will just, like, shove that all into his little bag and um, says, we'll sort this out later. <laughs> Twinkle Toes is watching that. I'm sure we can come to some kind of arrangement. My friend, I I just patched up my back. I am bl- I am bleeding. I've earned that gold now. Thank you. Oh, very well. Seems you are all set on having some gold for your accomplishments. You like stack out the gold individually into five stacks of five gold each. Um, he'll turn back to the halfling barkeep and say, uh, "My lady, your name one more time." Oh, my name is Belberry. Bel- I'm the owner and innkeeper. Belberry, yes. Quite nice to meet you. Did you um, happen to know where those gentlemen came from? Oh, well, uh, where they hail from? I'm not quite sure. But they just recently came from a dungeon. They were talking about how they were great heroes. Mm-hmm. That is why I invited them in here mm-hmm. to tell some stories. But- great heroes, it appears they were not if they were ready to scrap with strangers. Honestly, my dear, if you ever need somebody to- in here to tell stories, then... I am the one that you should be turning to. Well, I'd be delighted to have you. You're more than welcome back anytime you want. Twinkle There'll toes. always be a nice cup of ale for you. <clears throat> Twinkle Toes, I'm, I'm not going to lie. That was a sick burn. Yes. <laughs> I don't know how she'll recover from that one. It was quite eviscerating. It felt, it felt a little mean. It felt, <laughs> it felt a little mean. Was I a bit mean? No. Well, it was just the right. She did of try to have you trip and fall into some disgusting looking grease, so I do believe she deserved it. Thank you. I appreciate I appreciate that. As you all are talking, Hendred and Rolso give a little wave. Hendred says, thank you very much for taking care of that little uh, incident, but I must be on my way. It was nice to see you all. Hopefully we'll meet again soon. And Which is, guy was that? This is Hendred, the man who came in with the broken nose. Oh, okay, the guy who wanted us to take care of this. Okay. Yeah, and is now making his way Yeah, out. who like, told us to go, yeah. Goodbye, strange man. I hope next time you can solve your own problems. <laughs> and eventually Knight and his two companions also come out. Archbold looks at the group of you. Well, I knew I picked the right group of trepid young adventurers for my crew. Don't worry about the meeting. We'll take care of the rest of the morning. Just report to Remy, and he'll sort you out. Here you go. 
here's a map of the fairgrounds. Uh, hope you all can meet us in the morning right about 10, and I'll see you there. And he eventually takes off to Remy, looking nervously at the group of you, especially Shark. He kind of, like, is trying to be as far away from Shark as is possible while still maintaining some semblance of conversation uh, with the group. He says, yes, well, uh, well, I've got a job for you in the morning. Just when you get when you get to the when you get to the menagerie, uh, we'll 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 split you up and, and take care of it. But thanks. And just like dashes out the door behind the rest of the evening is yours and you have been offered free drinks and are here to stay with that being said we are going to take a quick call it 15 minute break and we'll see everybody back here for the second half thank you so much don't guys go for anywhere us. we'll be back right. back in a flash a Woo! hi everybody emily grace here thank you so much for watching three kobolds gaming and now back to our game Alright everybody, thank you for hanging out with us as we took a quick little break. So, last we left off with our heroes, they had just successfully uh, essentially bounced some uh, overbearing patrons, uh, actually who were employed by Belbury at the Tipsy Tengu, to uh, rile up some, some stories and some adventure to give this sense of, of grandiose importance to this tavern. But what went from free drinks and stories quickly turned into belligerence as this group accosted uh, patrons and struck uh, Hendrik, breaking his nose, which forced him to involve our heroes, who then ousted the... Uh, tipsy tavern goers from the tipsy tango. We are left uh, in the bar as uh, Belbury gets some drinks for our young heroes and we'll open back up. So, you guys have uh, just been offered free alcohol and some time to hang out. Uh, Night has left, giving you all the rest of the night to yourselves uh, before uh, joining back up with the menagerie in the morning. What would you all like to do? Um, um, I think Toad goes course. over to the bar and gets a drink. Yeah, so Belbury just grabs off. like four mugs, uh, two in each hand, he uses the bottoms to turn the taps. Uh, in one hand to fill the two on the other, switches them out, fills the, the second uh, two, closes the taps, throws them down on the table perfectly so that they all spread in four directions, and then grabs another cup, gives it a little twirl, fills it up, and plops it in front of the fifth one. It says, Oh, Belvry, I like your style. Well, I've been at this for a bit now, and I'd like to think I'm half the charm and half the reason the Tipsy Tengu is so... Well, tipsy. <laughs> um, Twinkle Toes um, is gonna grab one of the mugs and head over to a table. Twinkle Toes, you might have mine. I don't partake in substances such as these. And he'll just plop his intended mug in front of you. Penumbra, is it? Um, yes, that is the name I go by. Uh, seems as though I we're think both... you and I are going to get I should hope so. It seems as though we are both being addressed as given names. I assume Twinkletoes is not the name your mother gave you. Well, it's a bit complicated there. Um, I'm, I don't really know what name my mother gave me. I don't know her. Um, Twinkletoes is what I've always been called. Shark at this point has already finished his first drink and is like scooping up the second as he comes over to the table where Twinkletoes and uh, and Penumbra are. And uh, he's, he's so small and he just kind of like leans over Penumbra's chair and he's like, well, I heard that you have no family at all. Is that true? 
<laughs> no family at all, that is true. Yeah? Mm, yes, yes. Just me, it always that. has been. Well, that's quite all right, because me and Bear here, well, we don't have much of a family either. Well, that's, we've got each other, obviously, uh, but... Shark, if you don't mind me asking, um, it seems that your brother doesn't particularly like being called Bear. He seems to prefer the name Penumbra. Why do you insist on calling him the other name? Now, listen here. I've known Bear since we grew up as children. We were small and then we got bigger. Obviously, not, not a lot, not a lot, I'm not big, I got but bigger. I got bigger, um, no, we got, we were together all, most of our lives, and, well, his goblin name is Bear, and I'm a goblin, so he shall remain Bear. Twinkle Toes, this well, would be one of those subjects in which you might not get him started. Well, I'll tell you what, you know what, hey, hey, hey Bear, who are you? Do you mind that he calls you Bear? I expect it from him. Uh, he does not exactly enjoy my new lifestyle. And he like tear, stares down at his tattoos and some of the other markings that are on his body. Shark is a straightforward goblin. Not much for symbolism or metaphor. Shark says, and, 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 and why, don't you, why don't you show her how much you... Oh my god, I'm losing the accent. Why don't you show her how much you care about our heritage and our joint heritage? And he holds up a hand, and he's got this big circular scar in the middle of his palm. He says, "Go ahead, go ahead. Why don't you, why don't you show our new friend, our new family, what how, how it is that you treat family?" Penumbra sighs deeply and holds up the same hand as as Shark. Look, brother, I have explained this to you at least ten times since I arrived. This was Does not. Does this look like the hand of a thorn grabber? This was not by my own choosing. It was given to me as part of my rebirth. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have something to attend to. And he struts over to approximately here. Oh, we're not there is... the map, but I'll bring it back up. The map, on the map, there is a uh, bearskin rug that is on the ground. <laughs> oh no. And so Penumbra Star Bear walks over and kneels down next to the, the, the bearskin. It's just sort of like whispering softly to it. But here he goes again. Yes, well, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you have found some family, considering ours doesn't meet. And Shark downs the second beer and starts trying to like light a cigarillo, like trying to like strike a match on the table and light light the cigarillo. And oh, Shark! Okay. I'd appreciate if you didn't do that in here. It's uh, all right. I'll go outside. And he thank you. Kind of stumbles outdoors. Bastard is gonna step up next to Doctor. Uh, what's he? Doctor Forsyth. And he's gonna gesture towards Star Bear over there. He's gonna be like, "Sir, do you do you know that that green fellow?" And Doctor Forsyth is in the midst of like wrapping up his midsection. He's treating mechanically treating wounds on himself. Um, and he, I rolled, and he healed back to full health. Um, so in the midst of doing this like wrapping of his his midsection, he looks up and says, "I'm afraid I don't know know that one, but uh, I'm I'm." Familiar with his brother, though this one seems stranger. And he actually he's gonna call out to Penumbra. Says, "Penumbra, what, uh, what, what is it that you're you're doing over there?" I'm hoping to make sure that this creature has been laid to rest properly. And he's got like a palm on the top of the hand of the bear, and is like has his eyes closed. Bastard is gonna pull the doctor into like a whisper, and he's be like. Sir, I don't, I don't think it's gonna be, it's a good idea to get too familiar with him. Uh, I've heard some rather unsightly rumors about him and his clan, how they feast on human hearts to gain their strength. I don't know. I just, I just wouldn't want anything bad happening to you, good sir. That's rather frightening. Where, where did you hear this? It's just a rumor. I've, I've heard rumors about Mew, about the, uh, the halfling over there as well. That they're all good, but this rumor, though, it's the only negative one I seem to have. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just a little scared. Penumbra, <laughs> I, I do hope you're not worried about the bear. It's it's for fur. I support animal rights. 
Oh, it's a fake bear. Quite encouraging. I'm glad. Oh, I'm glad you're going to be working at. I do. Oh. I do like acquired sensibilities, though. As well, a fellow is... animal lover, I'm. I'm quite fond of you. Oh, this is quite awkward. I was about to go on. I was about to go on quite the tangent about how you've not laid this creature to rest properly, but. <laughs> well, I I would say the rug is laid pretty well. I did it myself. <laughs> yes, the rug is laid to rest properly, but the creature was not. Oh, in, thank in you. Any, in any case, I will. I will, I will stop what I was doing. Shark is, uh, immediately. Shark is losing it. Like, he was on his way to the door to go smoke outside, and he's just on the floor rolling around like boy. Uh, oh my god. Can Twinkle Toes tell whether the rug is actually faux fur or not? Roll whether perception. she's lying to him to... Go ahead and roll a perception, yeah. Cool, thank you. <laughs> Seven. Seven? Oh no, yeah. it looks pretty real to you. Okay. Um, I think the penumbra is just way too embarrassed to even like think about checking. I think he just like takes that <laughs> value and is like, okay, moving on. <laughs> um, he'll come Shark over and like sit back down. Well well. Yeah. Um, Zombra is gonna come over here Who? to where Who? Doctor Forsyth is. Is Bastro over there too? Yeah, I'm next you're, to Dr. You're, you're standing on Bastro right now. Okay, so you, my, I apologize. My roll 20 is on Safari, which apparently is not very compatible with roll 20, but my Google Chrome was not working. So here we are. Huh. Uh, we're working with what we got today. Episode one, this is what we're here for. Here we go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can move um, down the table, so... can slide down the table. Twinkle Toes is going to sidle up beside them and say, So you say you've heard some rumors about us, eh? What have you heard? Well, besides the, the man-eating sir over there, man I've heard good things about you. You're a little... You, you help uh, some noble, uh, disgraced noble bring... Brought, yeah, let me start over. You helped a noble be, uh, be brought to justice. Is that true? I've done a lot of noble. things in my time. Oh. Well, I hope you've only heard good things about me. May I interject and go back to the part where you said I eat men? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, I, now that I've met you, I'm sure it's that faceless and untrue. Honestly, like, that does seem quite... So hard. It seems quite problematic that you would believe that a goblin eats humanoids. That's... I, I, just, I just saw the other goblin take a yeah. bite out of that halfling woman. What you just saw? It's not, it's not that. It's not I that. wasn't trying to eat her. You just, just bit her very forcefully. It's a very <laughs> different thing to fight like as an attack than to try to eat another person. I yeah. got a chunk out, but I spit it out immediately. Yes, it seems as though. Oh, yes, uh, waiter, you might want to clean that up. It's still on the floor <laughs> over here. <laughs> Oh, don't worry, the bear will come over and clean it up. I'm sure oh, Numbers oh, are going to oh. bring it back. Uh, yeah, yes, so Daisy, the tavern server, kind of walks over with a bucket and a mop and uh, starts uh, That's a wrap. cleaning the, the <laughs> a wrap. Uh, slightly coagulated blood that is now splashed on the floor and part of the wall mm. from the, from the vicious bite uh, that Shark laid out. Um <clears throat> Shark at this point, uh, he's he is just laughing so hard at Penumbra just not being able to function as his like spiritual self. Like everything he seems to do gets like, oh, you're a cannibal. Oh, that's not a real bear. He finally kind of composes himself and he's like, uh, all right. And he finally gets the cigarillo lit and he's like half outside, like blowing the smoke outside, but like still kind of standing <laughs> indoors. Where did you? Did you hear this about my goblin heritage, where I've spent, or where I've spent most of my time recently with a different clan? Who, who is it that you heard is the responsible party for uh, eating the hearts of men? Just rumors I heard in, in the Tipsy Tengu. I've been and, here a few times. And would it bother you, Bastro, if that were true? 
Yes, it would. Actually, it would <laughs> bother me a lot if you ate human heart. Hmm. Then I would very much. Then I would hope for your sake that it's not. And he looks at the drunk guy who he sat next to, who is our sixth <laughs> member of our table. <laughs> and he like kind of like licks his lips and then goes back to. Wait, you lick the drunk guy's lips? I yeah, I lick Ooh. I lick his lips. <laughs> oh, what? I reach all the way over and lick him. No, he like like Penumbra licks his, his own lips consensually, and uh, and and continues along with the conversation. What were we talking about then? You not eating heart? Well, before we were talking about the um, rather problematic comment about what you choose to digest and what you don't, um, we were talking about some things that Bastro over here has heard hmm. about the rest of us. Well, yeah, what have you heard about me? Shark. I heard you got the thing for everything. You, you have a... You have a secret recipe too that you just will not give up. I'm a little curious about that. Ah, oh, well, uh, Doctor Doctor Forsyth, uh, do I not sell the best medicine in town? My my friend Shark here is a, he's a very successful uh, potion brewer of sorts, if you will, to put it politely. Um, I, I would not be surprised if he had a, a secret brew that he was not willing to part with. Now let's. Let's go ahead and call it what it is. I'm the vice president to the vice president of sales here in Absalom for the top pharmaceutical company. So, you you know, you why don't, why don't you give me a little bit of respect? And he, like, finishes up his cigarette, gives a little drag to Desmond on his shoulder, and, like, <laughs> flicks it outside and comes back to, to sit with you guys at the table. What's Shock, I will give you respect when you start listening to... The advice as your your doctor I've been giving you, those potions you drink, which turn you into a, a bestial form. We've talked about it. <laughs> and the oh, smoking. It's... We should not forget about the smoking. Bear, that was my last one. I told you, the last one ever. That was it. Right there, I don't have any more, see? I'm sure, yes. Desmond was his name? Desmond, like, gives a little cough and just, like, plumes of smoke kind of erupt <laughs> in a circle around him. <laughs> on your shoulder and kind of whiffs away. Belberry looks over. Shark, we talked about this. I wasn't me, it was Desmond. De Desmond, knock it off. And he kind of like puts Desmond back into his coat. He wears he wears kind of like a uh, a little bit of like a, a shawl overcoat. It's a very, um, not quite a trench coat, but he's got a lot of pockets and he opens it up and puts it in there. Mm -hmm. Places to hide secret cigarillos. Mm, nah, that was his last one. Penumbra, I must say, I'm rather curious about all the, the, the tattoos. What? Uh, I, it, it, I don't see Shark having any of those similar tattoos. What's the significance? That's because a true goblin would not have all those tattoos. Well, yes, perhaps a true goblin would not. Shark and I have spent quite a bit of time apart from each other. Shark off gallivanting and learning about potions and totes and things, but... I spent most of my time with a member of, with a collection of the Lyrun Kwa, a Shawanti clan out on the Storval Plateau. They housed me, they kept me safe, and they showed me their ways. These are markings from my spiritual journey and my escapades with them is part of my reawakening as Penumbra Star Bear. And he shows them to you, and they, they're very intricate. The most obvious one is the, like, the big crescent moon over his eye. Um, he also has... The other prominent one is a gigantic cave bear chest piece. He's got, like, very oh. large and very in charge. Um, and there's various other um, galactic, like, stars and moons and suns, and also um, animals. Like, there's, like, a raccoon on his side, and there are bats every once in a while just sort of all over his sure. visible body, yeah. Will, could I roll a recall knowledge um, on the tribe that Jack just mentioned? Sure. Or that Penumbra just mentioned? Uh, specifically for religion? Uh, I want to call, recall knowledge about the like the spiritual nature of what he was right. just talking about. Uh, yeah, go ahead. All right. 
So that is uh, 11 total. Yeah. Uh, so you are familiar with uh, the Shawanti culture in that it exists. Um, not much beyond that. And the, the only religious significance um, is that they don't really worship the same gods as most like men, elves, and dwarves, uh, most yeah. humanoids. Um, they tend to be, they tend to worship or have more spiritual significance in elements of nature. And that is by no means a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm painting with a broad brush, essentially, because each Kwa, each tribe has its own spiritual beliefs. Um, but you'd be hard pressed to find a member of any Shawanti culture who worships Eridan, uh, unless there are very specific sure. reasons, or worships Caden Kalian, or or any of the the inner sea Standard primary gods. Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, Penumbra, that is, I, I don't know. I've ever met a goblin who who follows Shawanti ways. That is as most unusual. It was certainly a product of circumstance. It's not exactly something I chose. But yes, it is rather odd, I'm assuming. Would you like to see something interesting? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm all right. I'm good. Me. It's Don't worry about it. five gold. <laughs> as long as you're not about to eat the heart out of that, that man right next to you, then I think we're fine. He um, He's going to turn... He's going to take a step over to here, around the drunk man, and says, watch closely. And pulling his hands together, he's going to, like, turn them over each other very softly as you see, like, some stars start to formulate in the middle of the of his space in, the, in his hands. And he'll kind of turn them over once or twice, and then he'll, like, thrust his wrists. And in a 15-foot cone southwest of him are is a big spray of stars um, and as he casts this, some of the tattoos on his body start to glow this, like, radiant white. Um, if you look closely, it's a lot of the, it's a lot of the galactic tattoos. Like, the moon is lighting up, and the stars and, and suns are lighting up on his body. Um, and his, he seems to be, like, a little bit lighter. He almost seems like a little bit, like, his clothes aren't hanging quite as heavily. Penumbra, I have a very serious question for you. I have a very serious answer for you. If I were to stand in that cone, would I be hurt? Or would it be this magical thing that could certainly help my performances? I would not advise being in the space <laughs> where my stars will be. But perhaps for However, flair, they could be behind you. Yes, that's my thought. Yes, we could certainly put together some sort of act with that. I believe there's an arrangement to be made there, yes. Wonderful. Shark I'm going set. to like this partnership. Oh, well. The rest of you Des have yet to prove yourselves, but I like Penumbra. <laughs> Desmond has something to offer as well. Check check this out. And he <laughs> tips the beer into Desmond's mouth, and Desmond just projectile vomits everywhere. Oh, <laughs> God. Oh, God. He watches the slime oh, ball God. just, like, absorbs <laughs> to twice its size. You see, like, the foam swelling up through the translucent green surface before this, like, hole ruptures in the side and just... Brawr, right in front of the table, almost like ejecting into like Bastro's, uh, Bastro and Twinkle Toes, your lap, as this like oh. wave of oh, expul expunged beer flows across the table at you. Excuse me, sir. Did you really not well. hear me complain when the woman launched grease at me? You are losing points, my good sir. Oh, I'm twinkle toes. I mean, it's okay. I can take care of it. Hmm. And you see, uh, Bastro's on his shoulder. The white dove kind of start glowing a little bit, and the muck that's on me and Twinkle Toes starts to clean itself up. It's called prestidi prestidigitation. Prestidigitation. Yes. Yes. that's a classic. And uh, and it's just gonna be tidying me and uh, Twinkle Toes as we continue to talk. I say, Bastro. I guess we can show her off. Bastro, you have earned your place as well. Yes, quite so, Bastro. That's quite a show you've put on there. Now, well, Doctor Forsyth, what do you bring to the table? 
Um, and at that, Dr. Forsyth is actually going to stand up and sort of like adjust his overcoat. Um, and he, he's, he's going to hold out his cane. He's going to say, what most of you all have been, while most of you all have been playing around with these cheap tricks and magic, I suggest that you look more to the modern world, what we have in front of us. Being a doctor has taught me a great many things, which Sharp can greatly attest to, um, I might say. And Penumbra and, um, what's, what's your name, Dan? I forgot. <laughs> Bastro. 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 Bastro, forgive me. Um, and Bastro, these tricks will, will only get you but so far in life. And I think I have greatly proven myself in the first combat as I did absolutely nothing and got hurt to half my health. So I think I have more than proved my worth. Yes, but I mean of a personal nature, my dear sir. I thought you were great. You looked very elegant when you got stabbed in the back. That's it, that's it. I've heard that before. That's not the first time I've heard that, you know. <laughs> All right, I well, she that... likes you, so I like you a bit more. And, and I don't know, I think that we maybe descend in more drunken nonsense for the night, unless anyone else wants to roll it out. I would like to see if anyone has any heard any strange rumblings about our new employer. This Archibald Knight, was it? Sure, anyone who is interested. I don't know much about him in particular, but I've heard some things about the festival itself. Well, I would assume Bastro is the expert, since he's heard all these rumors about all of us. Perhaps he's got his ear to the to the ground about Mr. Knight. Mm -hmm. uh, can I make but a recall knowledge? Sure, it's anybody... Uh, hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, anyone who would like to try to roll a society about Archibald Knight may do so. See if they've heard anything, seen Absolutely. anything. I will do so. <clears throat> yes. Uh, 22 for Penumbra. 22. Does anyone Natural else? Natural 18 for me, so that's going to be a 22 for Twinkletoes as well. Okay. I got an 18. 18. Bastro gets a 23. Nice. Oh wow. My God. Really did have his nose. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, you all are, regardless of how long you've been in Absalom, whether it's been a few weeks, a few days, or a few months, or for most of your life, uh, you all are very familiar with the fact that um, people have been coming to Absalom for months for the Radiant Festival, ever, ever since it was declared to be held uh, by the acting Primarch. Um, and along with this, there are a number of major exhibits um, that are hosted on the fairground. Um, that being said, though, there is space being sold, uh, essentially lots being sold for smaller attractions. Um, and there are tons, I mean, dozens, if not hundreds of these smaller attractions that are set up all throughout the Precipice District um, that have been rented out. One of the ones, and basically the closer you get to the actual festival grounds, the like more important your side attraction is, right? Mm -hmm. Archibald Knight uh, happened to be able to get one of the lots nearest to the, uh, to the Radiant Festival. Um, basically with his finances and his ability to promise uh, this mystical, magical menagerie of creatures, he was able to secure a decent spot. Um, and while he's obviously not at the same level as uh, some of the exhibits, uh, which people are most excited about, things like the Dragonfly Pagoda, um, which is an exhibit hailing from Minkai that has like these wondrous gardens, um, or you know, there's like a walking castle um, that people are really hype about. Um, but people still have been talking about this magical menagerie. Um, you've heard rumors of his, like, grand entrance into the city as he paraded dozens of carts, uh, down some of the, the main streets of the Precipice Quarter. Um, of course, all of the flaps on the sides of the cages were open to show things like, uh, a displacer beast and owl bears, um, animals that are very much uncommon. And if you've never been outside of Absalom in your life, which is a fair amount of the population, 
you never would have had the chance to see these things. And most people, even outside of that, unless you're randomly attacked on the road by something wild, are very unlikely to have ever seen these things. So there is a lot of, of hype about uh, Archibald Knight's Menagerie. That being said, like, there's really nothing more. Um, you know, without going around and questioning specifically, like, if he's been up to anything. Most people think just he's a really good showman who's uh, brought some exciting stuff that they really want to check out. Um, Do we have any inkling of whether these things were acquired tastefully, legally, ethically? No idea. No uh, idea. Could go either way. Yeah. Okay. Most of the information you're hearing is just the excitement about Archibald Knight, which mm. has only arisen since his arrival in Absalom. Like, if you were to ask before he had ever shown his face, nobody would know anything about him. And that was this year, most recently, or when was, when was Theo's arrival? About a month ago. A month ago, okay. Yeah. Yeah, just like in preparation for the festival, In, in right? preparation, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, as, as Gray said, I think we're just going to kind of get to know each other a little bit drunkenly. Yeah, and, and Belvery is... As I said, more than more than a gracious host, and is offering uh, as much as much booze of the, uh, you know, barley hopped variety uh, that you can consume, um, before sending you off on your way for the night, um, with a fair a fond farewell and um, wishes to see you all again in the near future. Where is everybody going? I mean, some of you are residents of Absalom. Some of you are maybe newer in town. Uh, what's uh, what's the situation? We'll start with the, the goblins. We have a house, or Shark has a house. In yeah, the Shark, has an, Shark has an apartment in the puddles, so he will stumble home at some point. And Bear is, uh, or Penumbra is uh, couch surfing. Couch surfing in, in at Shark's place. Are you yeah. following back? Are you going later? What's the deal? No, I'll go with. I'll, I'll go with him. Yeah. Right. Doctor. He Ford. has the keys, and he's going. <laughs> he has the keys. Him, so yeah. I can't. I can't get him after that. Doctor Forsyth. Doctor Forsyth lives over in the Ascendant Court District, um, and he will he will invite um, anyone who uh, you know any of our party who doesn't have a place to stay to to come come stay with him if they would like. Um, it's a it's a little bit of a walk, but not too far. So he is more than welcome to host, but uh, he's going back to spend the night at his place. Yeah, it's a good three to four mile journey, depending on where you are yeah, in the ascending uh, court. A bit of a walk. Yeah. Plus, uh, it's like really late at night, so the Uber surcharge is just going to be crazy. <laughs> it's going to be nuts. That, that lift. But Uber right. isn't around here, though. Um, yeah, it's only a lift zone here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Christ, I got to download lift now. Yeah. Sucks. It's being so glitchy. Uh, Bastro, what you got? I think Bastro will, will take up um, Dr. Forsythe's offer for lodging. And he will, he, will, he will gladly uh, walk with him home and have a nice long discussion about doctor practices and surgery <laughs> and all that great stuff. Oh, medical, a, a drunken intellectual conversation about medicine. Yeah. What does that yeah. look like for you two? Only go well. <laughs> oh my god. Maybe. So I, I guess Bastard would, would start with uh, uh, I saw you patching yourself up there, sir. Very good work. I, I'm quite used to patching myself up. What kind of stitching technique do you do you use? And he's like slurring his words a little bit while, while saying that. <laughs> well, you see, you do the, if you do the backstroke underhand before you do the left hand thicket, then it goes much smoother overall. Just try, try it. Try, try it sometime. Trust me. It'll I, get, I get there pretty often, so I'm sure I will I'll get the chance. Um, and I think we're just going to be talking like that, basically, <laughs> like, like different techniques we use and stuff like that. Would just uh, like to clarify that these two are not medical professionals, and please do not follow their advice. Yeah, but Dr. Forsyth and Bastro are, and that's what counts. And, yeah, we're, we're medical professionals in Galarian. These are real things in Galarian. I was addressing our audience. <laughs> uh, Twinkle Toes, what's your residential situation? Twinkle Toes is just going to pop around the corner to her new flat in the Precipice Quarter. Heck yeah. Okay. Upgrade. As you all make your um, way... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, um, she gets back there. It's very, very freshly built and very unfurnished at the moment. Got your, your blank drywall, kind of like Jack. 
Yes, exactly like Jack. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Why decorations when you cannot have decorations. It's, not it's pretty it. simple, actually. Um, Jack actually lived in the Precipice District. So. <laughs> yeah, funny enough. Exactly. Out of our walk for me to the Radiant Festival. <laughs> so you all make your way back to your respective uh, homes and lodgings. Um, it's not a particularly early morning, but uh, for some of you, especially those who went back to the puddles of the Ascendant Court, uh, it's a bit of a walk. Um, you all were requested back at, at the Menagerie. Um, I'm mean, actually... Let's let's take a quick look at Absalom together. I think that's a good idea. Ooh, right. here we go. So, might have been helpful when we were talking about places in Absalom to actually show Absalom, but what do I know? But man, so details, details. We're focusing kind of more down here on the southern section of Absalom. So. This is the Precipice Quarter. Uh, the, the entire Precipice Quarter uh, has been made into different, like, fair stops. But the actual main fairground is going to be in this, like, lower corner right here. Uh, where okay. it's kind of open just before, like, right where the wall meets the, the bay there. Um, all that green space there is going to be that main festival grounds. But there are attractions all over. Um, as I said, there are lots that are kind of scattered throughout the Precipice Quarter. Uh, if we take a scroll up here, the puddles where the goblins live right over here is named so because it is a section of the city uh, that is barely being kept from completely flooding. Um, kind of like a Venice situation, except there are no boats because it's only about anywhere from two to five feet instead of like tens of feet. Uh, it's like Venice, but they were a lot less prepared. Yeah. There are, yeah, there are more than four parts, uh, so quarters don't make sense, yes. Um, but hey, I wasn't on the council when they named it. There are also only three sections named quarters. <laughs> yeah, you get a little bit higher. Um, the Ascendant Court is kind of the l religious hub of Absalom. Uh, that's where Dr. Forsyth and Bastro are headed back to. Um, and you see this bit here in the middle. Uh, there is a massive crater. Um there in the center of the Ascendant Court with a tiny island in the middle of this crater um, upon which is the Starstone Cathedral that houses the Starstone. Um, and so the Ascendant Quarter uh, is kind of always like a festival ground because people are constantly making the claim that they're going to go take the trial of the Starstone. And there's an entire tourist business out of the Ascendant. Ascendant. Yeah, every single person dies except for the four that we mentioned previously. Wait, someone's name is Bastro Fanboy. That's oh my god, I saw that. <laughs> hey, we're already there. We're already there. Um, so good. And part part of the uh, the trial of the Starstorm is just getting to the Starstone Cathedral uh, because you're not allowed to use the bridge. The bridge is only for the uh, you know the clergy of the Starstone Cathedral. Um, so first the you gotta, group, you know, the janitors. Yeah. So first, you got to figure out how to cross uh, cross that chasm. It's a couple hundred feet, um, and they figure that's a good entry level test. So, uh, you all converge back towards the precipice corner, quarter, excuse me, bright and early in the morning. Um, the uh, menagerie is located somewhere in this. The lot is somewhere kind of. Got to get it a little lower here for the stream somewhere right in right in here uh just at the very northeastern tip there and so you all make your way back to the menagerie yes, we all right do. as sweet yes i'm gonna go back to our no map you arrive uh, at the menagerie, and it is very, very busy. Uh, you see right outside of the menagerie is a set of stalls and buildings that are being used currently. There's like a grocer, uh, a blacksmith, um, and then some food stalls and some just general wear stalls. 
uh, that are right outside the entrance to this lot as part of the fair. They are, they are attached lots that are for like merchandise, essentially. Um, and there's a fenced off section uh, in which you see uh, these, these five, there's like one big main building that looks like a walkthrough kind of exhibit. And then you see six carts that are placed uh, with the uh, sides currently down. So you can't see into them, um, but they're locked in place there. And there are a couple of open cages as well as a pond in the center. Uh, Remy is there waiting for you all uh, at the front and he's currently holding a small chest that looks to be about yay large. Um, as he's waiting for you all to come, he's kind of like tapping his foot. Uh, is anyone, everyone's just like kind of arriving on time or is anyone early, late? What's the deal? Um, sure. I have a feeling Twinkle Toes would get there pretty swiftly. Um, yeah, you're like right around the corner from and, this. Yeah, um, probably there about five minutes beforehand. I picture the goblins being about 15 to 20 minutes late. <laughs> yeah, but whose fault is it? It's We all know whose fault it would be. <laughs> I want to hear you say it. <laughs> we all know it would be Shark's fault. We all know. Shark is just like trying to finish up his brewing in the morning. And he's like, I gotta, I gotta make sure I got the coffee. And like, he's taking care of everything. And he's like trying to sneak a cigarette out the window and, and bears like try to bat it away from him. So yeah, we're late. We're definitely late. The doctor is is uh, is up early, um, and I, I think he corrals Bastro and tries to arrive very early, and has already like cased the joint and like done a lap, and checked in with Remy like right when he got there. Mm -hmm. uh, so Bastro would do. There, there, there there. Bastro would do anything the doctor would do or tell the, the doctor tells him to do. So he's right there with him, right and early. Fair enough. Does anyone have any kind of special morning preparations that they do? Uh, maybe for spells or what you got? I, yeah, I guess I do. Um, I, I, since I'm a level one witch, I can only have uh, two spells prepared per day. Mm -hmm. And so the two spells I chose is one, one slot for heal and the other slot for bless. Nice. Not really into doing damage or anything. I like to be a support class. Fair enough. Uh, otherwise... I have five other cantrips that may or may not come into play. We'll, we'll find out. We'll see what the day holds. Yeah. Anyone have any, like, ritual or anything that they do in the morning? I'm looking at Penumbra sure. and Shark. I know they've got some. Say, uh... <laughs> yeah. Twinkle Toes does yoga every morning when she wakes up. Oh, uh, yeah. Some sunrise toes. yoga on your flat top roof. <laughs> Gotta get that sun salutation going, you know what I mean? That's how you start That's the only way. Yeah. yeah uh, Followed by a kale she smoothie. Does. She starts every day with some kale. yoga and energized and ready. Speaking of kale smoothies, um, Penumbra does have like a like a brew that he makes and like some kind of beverage that he's drinking periodically. But I picture uh, I picture Penumbra having a very peaceful ritual in which he lays out like some animal bones. You know what I mean? Something very ritualistic or, or animalistic and. Um, trying to peacefully meditate and get in touch with the um, galactic forces as well as you know the universe in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, I picture Shark ruining that at every turn with a bunch of a cacophony of alchemical mixings and coffee brewing. Shark and Desmond have to have to prepare some of their reagents in the morning and, and some of the elixirs, and so like. Shark like rolls out of bed and Desmond is like immediately brewing coffee and Shark is just clanging around and dropping things, making so much noise and yelling at Desmond and cursing under his breath. It is not a peaceful atmosphere. And despite all of this, you all arrive some a bit late uh, to the front of Knight's Menagerie um, where Remy is anxiously awaiting you. Uh, you see him as you approach, whether you've been there or are newly arriving, kind of looking around every once in a while. He was nervous, or at least seemed skittish 
at the meeting, but you can see that he is visibly worried right now. Um, and as you all get there, uh, once again, he's holding this this like small chest. Um, he says, good. Now, um, for, your, for your first assignment, uh, I, this isn't really what we hired you for, but, um, uh, well, Knight didn't show up this morning. I'm sure he'll be back. He sometimes goes off on escapades with, uh, well, that's another another story. But uh, we need to get some of the supplies for the for the animals, especially the magical ones. And he pulls out like a long, like basically shopping list. And and Knight managed to secure, uh, well, he managed to secure some some trade deals uh, with with a wizard, uh, Mirin, uh, at Mirin's workshop. Um, and well. Here's the gold, and he like hands uh, probably either Twinkle Toes or Foresight this like small chest. Um, there's, be very careful. There's about sixty gold in there, uh, and people have been getting, ro getting robbed ever since the festival started, uh, which is why we're sending all of you. It's a lot of gold, and we don't want to lose it. Um, but but go to, to Karen's shop or Mirin's shop and and get this list, and then he hands the list to the other. Um, uh, for for the supplies for the day um yeah and he pulls out like a small map of the precipice quarter that's like very crudely drawn obviously by himself with like a vague x where he thinks that the shop might be um and I, the, here here you go normally knight does this but like i said he hasn't shown up yet can um, i roll a sense motive on what he just said <laughs> Sure. Uh, Go ahead and roll perception. What he was saying about night <laughs> mm -hmm. is the box able to be opened, or is it locked? Yeah, it's not locked. You open it. Okay. There's sixty gold in there. I was gonna say it's a locked thing. Also, oh, there's sixty gold in there. It's actually like both. <laughs> from the size that you gestured with the box, that's like half the size of Twinkle Toes. So she's gonna let Forsyth take that um, and take that big list um, and be like, "This is more." Yeah, it's like a one by two by one box, so it's not like massive, but it's it would be big relative big to her. relative to Twinkle Toes. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. She's two foot nine. Um, Yo. Uh, yeah. This... Twenty four perception. Twenty four. Uh, that's his motive. Yeah. Uh. So, you notice him blushing, uh, kind of awkwardly, uh when he was mentioning knights and his uh, forays. Um, okay. And Four. you remember him looking a similar way the previous night, uh, the previous evening at the tavern, uh, whenever Knight and Minera were talking to each other. Mm. Who is Minera again? Sorry. She was the uh, head veterinarian as we lose Bastro once again. We were up there again. We we're so close. We were it's all good. Um, so you would get the sense that there might be something going on there, but you're not quite sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. Put that oh, in the there back. He is. There he is. Never uh, look. Never look. <laughs> I was here the whole time. There we go. Fixed it. So, what would you all like to do? You have a map uh, of a crude map of the Precipice Quarter uh, with a somewhat clear mar demarcation as to where you're supposed to go, a shopping list, and a chunk of gold. Well, Shark, I said... um... Shark jumps up to grab the box from Dr. Forsyth and says, uh, yes, I know where Mirren's shop is. Come on, come. And he, like, jumps to grab it, but he's, like, three feet tall, so... <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Forsyth will, like, he will like, just, like, do this and just hold it up so that Shark cannot reach it. He's in tiny yeah. green hands. <laughs> he only jumps once, and then he just starts walking that way. <laughs> um, as soon as we are far away, like, a little out of earshot of Remy, um, Twinkle Toes will be like, all right, so I think we need to have a chat um, really quickly and just... Get on the same page about what we might be dealing with right now. What do you mean because what we're uh, no. dealing with? And I didn't like that very much. Yes, he doesn't seem as though he has his affairs in order. I agree. 
Also, okay. that okay. knife's missing. Shouldn't we be looking for him? Shouldn't it doesn't like, sound we're like employed he's... by him? Shouldn't we be? I don't to locate. That, I I I don't think that it was something we should be worried about. There is. There is something going on between Knight and uh, that other fella we uh, met last night, whose name escapes me. Mir Mira, Mirin. Uh, Mirin. No, Mirin, Mirin is a wizard. It is her. The woman's name is uh, Manera. Manera. Manera bread. A sense of this last night, and it was the same sort of nerves that. Uh, Remy was just speaking with him. Yeah, where, where well, Knight it chooses to eat his Panera bread is none of our business. So we shall resume our task. There's yes. nothing to be done about it. If he gets a whole soup in a bread bowl or he goes with the you pick too, it doesn't seem to matter much to us. I it used to do the you pick too with the salad, but you get much more value with the bread bowl than the soup I've found. Yes, but getting the bread bowl in the you pick too, they always look at you funny. They always say, like, who's this guy trying to make a meal out of not a true meal? I don't understand. I'm not quite sure I understand why they have such opinions about how I eat my banana bread. Twinkle Toes starts dashing down the street to um, the shop. Um, Leaping off walls and dancing the whole way, making a whole a whole show of it as she goes. But she is quick, and she gets there probably like five minutes before everybody else. So, I think Doctor Forsyth will turn to the rest of the crew and just be like, "You know, I I believe she was a performer at some point. Uh, it definitely shows. Have, have either of you ever heard of of, of Twinkle Toes and her performance?" Nothing about her performance. Yes, I, I, I'm loosely familiar with her. I, I, I've heard rumblings in the ascended court about her performances elsewhere in the city. She, she, she must. She's so light on her feet. She must. She must be someone. Famous. Hmm. I suppose she might be. I wouldn't quite know. But the only thing I've heard about Twinkle Toes is that not everyone seems to be her biggest fan. Perhaps it's good for us to have someone who has skills that people find threatening. As you all, as you all are walking, you kind of go from this um, this transition. You watch as you go from the fairground proper, uh, or the outskirts of the fairground proper, into the city proper, into the main squares of the Precipice Quarter. The journey is about a mile and a half uh so it is by no means quick especially with the crowded city traffic uh exacerbated by the fair and people heading in the opposite direction from you uh into the fair as you are trying to head into the city um but as you all are making your way you happen upon a small square that is laid out with a variety of food carts however you walk into the square off of the streets and you see smoke and hear profanities rise up from a cluster of the food stalls near to a small park. The commotion centers on two particularly decrepit booths positioned across from one another, each little more than piles of haphazardly nailed boards, their peripheries scorched and smoldering. Suddenly, a clay pot flies across the intervening space, smashing against one of the scorched stalls and splattering f flaming oil across several others. And you hmm. see what appears to be two goblins fighting in this square as a blaze erupts around them. And that's where we're going to leave it this week. Oh man! Well, these maps are sick. Dude. So good. Oh my mm. god! Thank you. I spent a lot of time sourcing them from the book. <laughs> also, there can only be two goblins. So well, obviously there's currently the four. So something's gonna have to happen. Uh, this, is a, this is a problem. This Thank you so much. And Shark had just gotten in a fight in the square. Oh, no, <laughs> these are two entirely unrelated goblins. Thank you everybody so much for joining us on our first adventure today. We're so excited for this story. 
that we have, and we hope that you all can join us again next week at 7 p.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, to join us once again for the next installation of our Agents of Edgewatch story. Thank you all so much for coming, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot, guys. Good night. Bye. Be sure Thank to you. check us out on social media so that yep. you can be up to date about everything that we're doing. We love you all, and we'll Woo. see you later.